Hello, I'm Sahel Mirza, and welcome to the first of two special episodes of Voices of Care, which comes from the Care Show in Birmingham. The adult social care sector is one of the most important in our nation, employing almost two million people, a cause for great celebration. However, many commentators are saying that the sector faces an existential crisis in terms of funding pressures and workforce retention and recruitment crises. How are these to be resolved? In these two episodes, we'll be speaking to leaders across the spectrum of social care, hearing their views and insights about how the sector can be reformed and truly appreciated. So join me for this special episode of Voices of Care. I'm delighted uh, once again to uh, welcome Dr. Jane Townsend, Chief Executive of Home Care Association to Voices of Care. Jane, thank you for taking time out uh, to join us. If I may, I'd like to begin by uh, congratulating you on your appointment as Chair of the Care Provider Alliance. Well, thank you very much. Yes, it's really important that we work together with One Voice um, across the sector. So there are 10 members representing mental health, autism, learning disabilities, care homes, home care, shared lives. Um, yeah, so it's a really good group. No, it's brilliant, and a lot of them are represented here today, mm. here in Birmingham. It's a tremendous buzz. Uh, you're speaking later, of course, and a uh, fabulous time for the sector. Yeah, I think, um, well, you know, demand is rising. There are, remain many problems to solve, and unfortunately there appears to be little political will to do so um, because they know that the public is obsessed with the NHS, so that's all they talk about. Um, and I guess politically social care has caused trouble for certain prime ministers in the past so they are nervous about talking about it. And yet that's despite um, organisations like the Future Care Coalition's recent report, Carenomics, actually saying that you need to unlock the economic potential of social care, 50 billion plus uh, you know, gross value add to the economy, nigh on 2 million people working in the sector. Um, it plays a huge role in all of our lives. I know, and you know, if, if it were viewed as an industrial sector in its own right, and I think Skills for Care have revised, they've updated that number, it's like nearer to 55 billion. And um, I think it's about you know, twice the size of agriculture, for example, and bigger than some other well-known sectors. So I think maybe we're missing a trick by not advocating in that way. <clears throat> but as you say, you alluded to, it's been around on agendas, manifesto commitments, um, social care. But I want to tackle the same issue that we've talked about before, the funding which then feeds into pay and all the rest of the things. And I think the, the gap between the provision and funding and the true cost of care mm. remains a gaping hole. Care England in a recent report quoted 650 million for, for home care. Whatever the numbers are, um, the gap is still, is still mm. phenomenal. Mm. Mm. Yeah, oh, for sure. And, and I think, you know, politically, uh, the only way that that could be addressed is by somehow raising taxation. And that isn't what many people want. You know, and I think that honest conversation with the British public, if you want better public services, you've we've got to be paid for it. You can't have, you know, Scandinavian style health and care services on Singapore tax levels. No, absolutely. And and the tragedy is of course while this is all being kicked around or maybe not even brought onto the field in terms of substantive policy discussion, many, many um, care hours in home care etc are, are not being filled and we're having a growing unmet need well in in some places that's true but we're also at the moment seeing oversupply in some places and what i would describe as mismanagement of supply and demand and we're very concerned about it because international recruitment is in the mix there mm -hmm. and we feel very strongly that if people um come to our country we need to treat them in an ethical way we need to support them and we need to treat our domestic workforce much better as well so uh, we need to think collectively uh, central government local government the regulators home office uk visas and immigration everyone needs to work together to solve it at the moment everyone's passing the buck and they're saying things like, um, well, home care providers shouldn't recruit people unless they've got the hours, guaranteed of hours. But you will know from having run a home care business that you don't ever have guarantee of hours, you, you know, because people come and they go and the councils, many of them use framework contracts to put the work out. And what they've done in many places is opened up their frameworks to many more people. 
uh, many more providers. So that's just diluted. It's fragmented the hours across many more. So no individual provider has got enough hours to be sustainable. And it makes it worse if you've if you've brought in international recruits and you're trying to comply with the Home Office, uh, you know, with the conditions of the sponsorship license, which is that they're supposed to have annual salaries of a minimum of twenty thousand nine hundred and sixty. So we, we can't really manage it like that, and we, 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 we need the international recruits. You know, we need them because we, our domestic workforce is, is, is dried up. Um, but if we're going to do that, we've got to do it in a coordinated, thoughtful, evidence-based way, which I don't think is happening at the moment. Well, until the uh, Valhalla of that policy approach, if we just bring it down to perhaps a bit more everyday um, matters, uh, market sustainability is a threat, uh, you've been on record as saying as a home care association, from a segment of uh, the operation of the whole home care, se home care uh, sector that sometimes overlooked. And that's the issue of late payments. I think you've run mm. research some, some, I think it's over 20% of uh, home care providers have been waiting more than 90 days for payment. Mm. Mm. It, it really is quite important, isn't it? Yes, it's, it's councils and NHS bodies. Um, I think it's got worse because of the dire financial situation of many councils and effectively what they're doing is pushing their cash flow risk onto providers, probably not realising that if it's a small business you can't hold that level of risk. You know, For some of them it's going to be the difference between making payroll or not and you know, some of the amounts of money that are owed are huge, like £350,000. Hundred thousand pounds, hundred and sixty thousand pounds is a lot of money for a small business. It's a lot of money for any business, but um, and and it's just unnecessary. So Completely, yeah. So I th hopefully that can be a lever that can be pushed in the advocacy mm. that you're doing. A couple of final points as uh, we're obviously constrained in terms of time, unfortunately for today. Um, Long-term workforce plan. The NHS has published one. Um, the NH for social care is conspicuous by its absence. What is the situation? Workforce um, Skills for Care uh, report in Jan July said, luckily there's been, or very positively, there's been an increase in uh, the total number of the workforce, but vacancy rates are substantially higher in home care than the rest of the social care sector. Yes, um, basically the workforce numbers have recovered a bit, but they haven't recovered to the level that they were at at, at the end of 2021. And all of that increase has come from international recruitment, and that you know therein lies the risk. And, and particularly in home care, because of the way it's commissioned and purchased, it's difficult to guarantee full-time contracts for staff. And we're concerned that providers are putting international recruits on zero-hour contracts and um, makes it very difficult to be compliant. The workforce strategy, though, the, the government has actually listened, and I believe that Skills for Care is going to be leading on creating one for social care. I think that's going to be announced this week um, when they that their new report um, on the sort of state of the workforce is coming tomorrow. So um, that I think will be part of that announcement. Well, we look forward to that, and mm -hmm. part of that will be as a final question is obviously you know the numbers. Um, Potential Skills Care said that we could lose 430,000 people from the social care sector broadly if people retire given their demography. We need 480,000 by 2035 or different other numbers depending on who you're talking to. Pathways to learning and development and training will have to be revolutionised if we're going to meet those numbers. I know, but I think also it comes back to the funding as well because Skills for Care's projections are based on on demographics, um, you know, on the numbers of, of people over 65 in a given area. And if, if you look back, their projections have been quite accurate. The problem is that there's a lot of unmet need because councils don't have enough money. So there is a bit of a risk of Skills for Care saying we, we know we've got this number of vacancies, but the reality is we can't afford to pay that many care workers. Do you see what I mean? But, you know, but then that, that unmet need just ends up putting more pressure on hospitals because people deteriorate and end up in, in an acute crisis um, and we haven't got the beds or the resources in the hospitals to cope so somebody somewhere needs to grasp the nettle. So it's the classic uh, vicious cycle. Yeah. Um, I think uh, this space will be filled with lots of conversation in the next 12 months as we run to a general election. Uh, I'm grateful as ever for your time and wisdom and I hope you'll come back uh, to join us again when we have a special focus on social care and the future. Thank you so much for today. Thank you, Sahel. Pleasure as always. I'm delighted to welcome Tricia Pereira, 
Director of Operations at Skills for Care for this special episode of Voice of Care. Tricia, thanks so much for taking time out of your busy day to join us. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. It's a really great opportunity. Um, and I was here at the, the um, care show and I thought great to be part of a podcast i haven't been part of a podcast before so thank you well it's it's our privilege and i think the care show has been super busy you've been busy yeah. i think you've been, been on a panel this morning there's a lot of energy what was the panel uh, yeah. discussing it was it's buzzing today isn't it there's so much going on um and i was on a panel this morning with care provider voice yep. um, and we were talking about amongst other things all the topical things around workforce well-being supporting recruitment and retention really how we invest in staff so looking at um, building capacity as well as retention mm. and also looking at um, all the innovation that's happening and attracting younger people into social care so thinking about um, how we get people from uh, in years 9 10 and 11 thinking about social care as a career for their future okay that's yeah. interesting I, my daughter's <laughs> in year nine so I'll be intrigued to talk to you about that uh, yeah. uh, later on but and I think it's part of um, the ethos here is to celebrate the sector I mean Definitely. skills for care extremely well known uh, and I think your s state of uh, adult social care report last year I know you've got a new one coming yeah. up very shortly yeah. um, talked about the scale of the sector because it really is an yeah. important employer and contributor to the economy most definitely people don't realize actually that social care employs more people our workforce is larger than the NHS and the NHS get a lot of the attention and quite rightly gets a lot of the attention but it couldn't work without social care. So it's really important um, that we are talking about social care, that we're uplifting the voice of people who are working in social care and employers as well. Um, and we're doing a lot of work around changing the narrative and the perception, the public perception about social care. Because we will all be touched, just like we're all touched by the NHS, we are all touched by social care in some part of our lives, but we perhaps don't recognise that as much as we do with our health colleagues and the work that they're doing. No, absolutely, and that's now be going to become even more important yeah. as we integrate with mm -hmm. uh, health and social care in theory and in practice. Yeah. Uh, and you, I think you've brought uh, a long career in local authority social care yeah. with you to Skills for Care, so you're able to see, I guess, the van different vantage points of all the stakeholders. Yes. Yeah, so. Um, if I can, can I touch on the care workers pathway? Yes. Um, because I always think about my own career in social care. So I started out working in, actually, as a volunteer when I left school um, and then worked in residential care before going to university and becoming a social worker. So quite rightly, you said I've worked in, in local authorities. Um, my last role was working in London Borough Local Authority, so I was head of adult social care there. But during the pandemic, I started to become more vocal about the work that we're doing in social care um, and so I wanted to become closer to influencing policy mm. and really championing the stuff that we're doing at, at Skills for Care because I've always admired Skills for Care which is what led me to moving from local authority into um, Skills for Care now and having that national view and oversight and that led me to actually just before that led me to be invited to um, chair co-chair one of the task forces for the advisory group for the COVID-19 task force because it's so important that people hear directly from us and hear directly from people who are working in social care people who are drawing on social care and employers as well collectively we have a really powerful voice and there are opportunities that perhaps we we need to be in the room to make um, to make that change. So working with ICSs and ICBs and hearing our voice around the table, it's fundamental really to shape the integration um, or the integrated agenda in the way that we're working. We have to be there. No, absolutely. That's a very inspiring story <laughs> if I may say so from volunteer to uh, policy level influence and, and, it's, and it's needed frankly because um, the numbers that yeah. came out in your um, size and structure of adult social mm -hmm. care workforce data in July this year show some improvement because last year's were really really um, worrying figures 165,000 vacancies now down to 152,000 yeah. with a big jump in uh, the number of people joining the workforce 20,000 yeah. however there's still 152,000 vacancies there is and that it remains a big challenge for the sector it does but remember this isn't something that we can overturn um, overnight this is a long-standing problems long-standing issues um, but we have started to see an increase 
Now, during the pandemic, we saw an increase and we have to we have to really retain people. So we're looking at recruiting people, but also retaining the skilled um, workforce that we have. International recruitment has been something that's been really positive. Um, so we're seeing an increase in numbers um, there, but also growing, homegrown workforce as well. So working hand in hand with employers, as I've said, looking at new initiatives, especially around young people, um, because we're an aging population, we're an aging workforce. So it's, it's not something that we'll see huge leaps um, within the next three or four years, but there are leaps, there are things that are happening, um, and we've seen that. One of the things that um, we'll show in our, our current state when it's, when it's launched mm -hmm. is that we've had an increase in men who are joining social mm -hmm. care. So it's up a small percentage, I think from 18% to 19%, but actually that's 300,000 men who are working in social care. So when we talk about the vacancies, actually there are 150 opportunities for people to start their career in social care. And they're the kind of narratives that we need to really um, share. So I think any day now, if it hasn't happened already, the Department of Health are launching their their current recruitment campaign mm. which again will have we're, we're hoping to see will have another impact of showcasing just what we're doing and encouraging people to work more in social care and look at the benefits the positives of working in our sector no, so that's and that's a refreshing narrative and i think turning the dial we're looking forward to your report coming out yeah. uh, with more men working as you say and it's not an overnight fix no. Retention, you've talked about that a couple yeah. of times, and if I may, I just want to just focus on one aspect of that. Uh, your work uh, includes work with the Department of Health and Social Care mm -hmm. as co-chair of the Social Care Workforce Race Equality Standards and, of course, the BAME Communities Advisory yeah. Group. It's a very important initiative to ensure that we have a truly inclusive culture in social mm -hmm. care. We've heard about the RES standards in NHS a lot. Can you tell us a little bit about how that's now impacted because skills for care played a big role in creating yeah. the social core rest standards yeah you're, you're right so we we um, funded the scoping exercise mm. to see whether it was feasible to have um, the workforce race equality standards for social care and then we worked with the Department of Health two years ago now with the chief social worker um, Lynn Romeo to and the interim chief social workers at the time to um, test the, um, the res, the social care res, with 18 local authorities first. Now, we got off to, it was fantastic. We had the uptake, I think we had 18 places, but over 35 local authorities wanted to come on board. And this was during the pandemic where things were quite challenging, but people saw um, the need and the commitment. They wanted to look at their workforce, they wanted to look at the leadership of their workforce, and they wanted to look at the how to create um, diverse leadership teams and really have that inclusivity. Now, it was funded by the Department of Health and unfortunately through social care reform, um, the current implementation of that, and it was also championed by the Health and um, Care Select Committee, but unfortunately because of austerity and finance it has um, financially it was deprioritized mm. but skills for care are committed to support employers because we had a number of employers who were coming forward saying we wanted to get on, on part um, and be part of this so we've decided to fund the res um, for this year and then look at um, how we can develop a sustainable model funded by the sector now it's crucial that we have inclusive teams because as we know that incre increases productivity it increase, increases belonging people feel valued people feel heard we have stronger teams we're also able to have better outcomes for people who are drawing on and receiving care and support the evidence is there and the res is just one of the things it's a self it's a sector led improvement tool so it's one of the things that will help to shape that and it's really refreshing that we're having employers come to us and say we want to be involved and we want to take part but we do need to have a sustainable model to be able to do that um, so we are in this phase we're doing this round of data collection exercises we're doing we're talking with the sector we're engaging with the sector and then hopefully next year we'll be looking at um, bringing more people on board um, 
if you're looking at the shape of social care, uh, 23% or 24% of the workforce are from black and Asian minority ethnic backgrounds, but it's not reflected in leadership roles, um, and that's what we're hoping to change. Um, and that's one. Of, this is one of the ways we're doing it. No, it's very refreshing. I think with the general election almost certainly coming up in the next 12 to 15 months, the funding for this really important work is. hopefully will become something that's central, uh, advocated for by the likes of yourself yep. and Skills for Care and the wider sector. Because until we truly move the dial on inclusion, we will not have a workforce that represents yep. or a leadership that represents the people that this care force, the care sector actually serves. Exactly, and um, also we're talking about prevention and we're talking about personalised care and support and that's why we need to have inclusive leadership teams um, because we're bringing that different way of thinking, we're, think we're bringing the innovation, we're bringing the creativity and we're also shaping commissioning practices. So all of these things go hand in hand. If you have inclusive teams you'll be able to look at the truly the needs of the, your communities, your local communities and be able to commission in the way that reflects the local communities as well. Well, on that uh, exhortation to ensure <laughs> that we move the dial in social care, uh, thank you very much, Tricia, for sharing your insights and your passion. It's been a pleasure. Oh, thank you. I'm delighted to be joined by Richard Eyre, Social Care Advisor at Care England uh, for this episode of Voice of Care. Richard, thanks for taking time out of a very busy schedule to join us today. Absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me. No, it's a, it's a pleasure. Uh, it's, I've been around now, around the care show, there's a tremendous energy around there. I know you, your uh, section has been really, really busy with lots of people asking lots of questions. We, we, we've, we've had sort of two and three deep people waiting, queuing to kind of talk to us. So yeah, <laughs> really good vibe, really, really positive. And in terms of the sector, um, Care England has produced a report about the long-term sustainability yeah. uh, with a number of uh, raft of demands uh, and I think very cogent arguments about what needs to be done. Uh, but I think one of the key things in the a line that struck me was that the sector, despite some of the challenges which we're going to talk about, it is brimming, it says brimming with talent and enthusiasm. And it is an extraordinary sector that contributes so much and sometimes the narrative about that is forgotten. Uh, the media likes a, a, a difficult story, a challenging story. <laughs> the news is never about how positive and wonderful <laughs> things are. And there's a lot of inward investment still coming into the sector. There are a lot of green shoots. There are organisations that were previously not profitable that are starting to turn a profit because they've had to readjust their business models. So there are some positive stories out there. There is still a backdrop of people who are incredibly challenged. And there are providers out there who are struggling to keep themselves afloat. There is a significant proportion that, that have looked to exit the market in the last 12 months. But there is new blood, there is new energy, uh, there is a vibrance and there are people that are turning the, their organisations round um, and thriving. And that's going to be an important part in of itself but also for the broader hopefully integrated health and social care sector to work properly. Yeah, I think data is really really important but mm. um, we are stronger together than we are apart mm. and I think my career over the last years has been challenging local authorities and government bodies for more money for the sector. Actually what we're starting to do now is work more collaboratively and collectively to lobby government to support the sector for, you know, as, it, as it's needed. We are stronger as a voice with commissioners, providers, uh, providers of all different types uh, to, to, to lobby for the same arguments, to ask for the same things and to rather than us all asking for individual things, to ask for the same things around how we can fix the workforce, how we can fix funding, how we can make sure that quality stays the top of its game etc. No, and that's I think never more needed your your report uh, Care for Our Future which was published in September um, doesn't pull any punches and it's it takes the, the debate right to the heart of the matter which is around funding I think you did analysis of the market sustainability plans mm -hmm. and let's go back to the true cost of care and there's that gap that the report identifies of approximately this is for residential care and nursing care the true cost sometimes being 196, 178 pounds for res residential and nursing care, out below what the true cost of care is, 1.5 billion pounds. This is an issue that has to be tackled if we're going to take social care reform seriously. Absolutely, and that was 1.5 billion at 22-23. We have had suboptimal inflation since then, so the number has grown. We also um, did a, a study, this is the Care Provider Alliance did a study 
with Languisson to look at some of that data and the data suggests that the local authorities have slightly understated the cost of care so actually the gap is bigger it's probably north of the two billion so we do need to really understand what that number is but we need to close it because we've had this high period of inflation with energy costs food costs uh, rising interest rates it's really had a very detrimental impact um, on on the, the care sector and of course the care sector has its own inflationary mechanism, which is the national living wage, that, that, that changes completely outside of inflation and has done for several years. Um, we can't just inflate for inflation. We have to inflate for the basket of goods that the care sector buys. And that gap is sadly getting bigger. Although well, government policy has tried to, to try and close it, it has got bigger. So it's really important that care providers find ways to become more efficient. And being, coming from a care provider background, you kind of think there's only so many more efficiencies we can implement. But there are always different ways of doing things and we've put a whole package of things together to try and help providers reduce costs. And if we focus on VAT, if we focus on energy, if we focus on food costs, these are all ways that we can actually shave a few pence here, a few pence there. The, the, the benefits of marginal gains create that, 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 def, that um, uh, uh, will help close that void between the cost of care and, uh, and um, what fees are paid by local authorities and CCGs. And just touching upon one of those aspects, because there's a big uh, question that you propose and uh, a five-year plan for whoever the new government is over in the next 12 months if we have the election within that period, which we have to have, um, £10 billion of investment, etc. But uh, looking, as you say, tactically, what can be done immediately? I think you've called for, within the first 100 days of a new government, to uh, apply zero rating for uh, welfare services. And that alone, if you can explain that a little bit, um, potentially injects over £350 million into the sector. Absolutely. Currently, um, care providers are unable to, to recover VAT uh, because they're exempt from VAT. Making VAT zero rated will mean that care providers can register for VAT and then recover the VAT that they incur on their goods and services. So that would equate to sort of 30 to £50 pounds per resident per week in a care service. It's the same for domiciliary care, slightly smaller number, um, but they can recover uh, VAT. And that's the equivalent of sort of like a 5% uplift in fees that, that does not impact local authorities or um, the NHS who are funding care because they are able to recover VAT for themselves. It wouldn't apply to self-funders. Um, there is a way at the moment to uh, uh, restructure the VAT, so despite government saying that they will zero rate VAT, providers can register for VAT recovery, but not all local authorities are currently engaging in that process, but it is growing. And there's a fantastic um, uh, publication that's recently been put out that, that really does grease the wheels for ICBs to look at how they can engage with VAT restructuring to help providers recover that essential sort of 5-6% from their care costs. Yeah, and the imperative to do that is, is significant. You mentioned home care, the funding gap there, I think the report talks about 650 million. That may be under understated, so yeah. it's, it's significant there as well. Oh, absolutely. And uh, you have to think the Fair Cost of Care exercise was very much done at a point in time, looking at what costs were at a point in time. So we're looking at scaling that forward. But what we've not done, and no one's done, is says, well, hold on, we're not saying that care provision at that point in time was optimal. We've got ESG, Environmental, Social and Governance Reporting and Requirements. We've got to reduce our emissions by 68% by 2030, 78% by 2035. We've got to implement digital transformation. We can't do these, these things out of the same margins we had before. We need more funding injected into the sector to be able to set... Uh, the, the sector up for the future because we've got an aging population we need 500 or four five hundred thousand new care workers in the next sort of 10 20 years we, we've got a long hard road ahead of us so we need to make sure we're looking at the future cost of care not what it was in the past absolutely and you've talked about workers now the lifeblood of the care sector are the workforce it's mm -hmm. a quintessentially despite all sorts of technical logical innovations a quintessentially human endeavor as it will always be um, and the the report that you produced talks about a couple of uh, things now there is no workforce plan at this moment there is potentially one coming uh, for the social care there is one for the NHS but there's a couple of measures that you've proposed um, immediately and medium term uh, one being the professional registration of care workers yeah, I think it's really important that we start to professionalise the workforce and we, we need to make sure that they have career progression opportunities. These are recognised individuals as providing such a valuable role in society. They've got reward and recognition that's got parity to the NHS, that they are uh, remunerated appropriately. And we've talked about the sort of the £15 per hour pay wage. Uh, we need to make sure their pay terms and benefits are equivalent to the NHS. 
it's, it's, it's important that we treat these individuals with respect because they are committed to working in an environment looking after some of society's most vulnerable individuals. Absolutely. And looking further ahead, you mentioned that number, it depends on which publication research we're talking about, but we'll just pick the Health Foundation, 480,000 uh, new care workers by 2035. Yes. We may lose 430,000 um, because of the demography and the age gap. Yeah. So there's going to be a tremendous need for innovation in training and also for the number of workers, sheer numbers. Now, your, your report talks about the idea of two things that struck me. One, to make sure within this new environment under the Health and Care Act of integrated care systems that social care and its workforce has a voice across the systems. Care provider voices need to be represented at the top tables. Um, care care, the care sector has been done to by local authorities, central government and the NHS for many many years. Mm. The solution and the, the solution to the problem lies within the adult social care sector. So it needs a seat at the top table to help influence and direct policy in a way which is going to help recruit and retain individuals. We've had 70,000 people come from overseas in the last 12 months to plug our recruitment deficit. But if you think that we've only reduced the deficit by about 13,000, that means about 57,000, according to my maths in my head there, <laughs> uh, domestic workers have gone. We've got a domestic workforce problem. Mm. So we have to look at all this holistically and we can't solve those problems if we do what we've always done. We have to do something different. And what we haven't had is the care provider's voice at the top table. We need to be part of the decision-making process to say what's going to work, to make sure the carers, the care provider's voices are heard at the top upper echelons of, of, of um, the sector to make sure we're making changes that will have a positive impact. International recruitment is a fantastic solution. The international workforce has, has saved our NHS in, uh, in, in the past. They will absolutely, no doubt, help save um, uh, uh, the, the adult social care sector. However, we've got a domestic workforce that we have to be cognizant of the fact that they are leaving us in droves. We have to solve that problem. We've got to we've got to do something different. We can't just leave this and rely on international workforce causing problems in other countries uh, by just stealing their workers. And if we do this correctly, your five-year plan is to have a fully funded workforce uh, plan, ten billion pounds of extra funding, seven point three billion coming from the fifteen pound pay rate, and just to broaden the contribution of the sector, uh, residential nursing home. I think the latest stats out of the NHS. Uh, for hospital discharge uh, in July 23 pointed out to the fact that 22% of those that have been waiting for 14 days or more to be discharged were actually waiting for a place in residential or nursing care. Mm -hmm. So as we fix and honour the social care sector properly, which is what you're calling for, this will have multiple effects for the whole of the operation, including the NHS. Absolutely. And there's probably about 40,000 plus empty beds within the, 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 the care provision sector that could take these people out of hospital overnight. We don't have the workforce to, to, to care for the individuals when they are in the, those, those beds. So we, we need to make sure we've got a workforce strategy to recruit and retain high calibre, high quality individuals who want to work in care, who are suited, well suited to working in care, who will add value to working in care, offer them career progression, offer them a salary that means they can meet their basic needs. They're not attracted to go and work in a supermarket or in the hospitality sector, career progression and respect. And I think that's where the kind of the, um, the, the, the registration of individuals will help offer respect and training and support for people who, who, who can then develop themselves with a respected career. I think uh, the call for respect has long been overdue. The pay rise is long overdue, you say in your report. Uh, we are heading towards an election year. One can only hope that the report will be listened to. Voice of Care will be delighted to have you and Care England come back and share your wisdom next year when we expand our discussions to look forward to the future post the election. But for today, I'm delighted that you found the time to share your insights with us and thank you so much for doing so. Well, thank you for the opportunity. It's great. Thank you. My pleasure, Richard. Thank you. I'm delighted to be joined by Stephen Patrick, Chief Executive Officer and Co-Founder of New Cross Healthcare. Stephen, thanks very much for joining us uh, on this special episode of Voices of Care. Always great to be here with you. It's a tremendous energy out there at the care show here in Birmingham. I know you've been around meeting people, seeing some of the speakers. It's a fabulous positivity. Great positivity, a lot happening here and it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. First time for me at the care show. So it's uh, got nothing to compare it against, but um, speaking to a lot of people here, they're saying that uh, you know there's a real energy and passion, which is great to hear and see. 
No, absolutely. I mean, Care England have uh, produced a report recently about the sustainability of the social care sector, talking about the fact that actually it's brimming with talent and enthusiasm. And I guess the one vantage point you have, um, I hate to remind you, but 27 years now passed since New Cross Healthcare went from an idea to an actuality, and it's been an extraordinary journey over that time, hasn't it? Yeah, it's been amazing. And uh, myself and Michelle, when we first launched the company, literally from a kitchen sink, um, uh, and to see the company and people grow within the company has been really, really rewarding. And I think you know, last year we uh, we, we provided 8.5 million hours of care, um, 850 thousand shifts, and. Um, what was really great to hear also, 350,000 training courses, 350,000, amazing. And that's obviously with New Cross and Future U, which and is our... And these uh, are provided for free, this is part of the contribution to so actually someone who wants to develop their career or join this uh, social care, these, all these training courses, 350 training sessions, all for free? All free, and of course our future, the future is that obviously to provide uh, you know, um, uh, university level uh, training, uh, for nurses and ultimately doctors as well so we're on that journey and uh, you know really really excited and uh, you know I think we're at a stage at the end of this year we'll have some uh, we'll have some big reveals as they say well I'm looking forward to hearing about that and part of the, uh, the journey social care counterintuitively people don't realize is one that's very very uh, replete with technological innovation because it has to be because mm. it's got a funding uh, constraint etc and I think part of the developments for New Cross has been the, a number of shifts that have been shifted to the, the app that you've uh, developed yeah. and actually that's growing every day. Yeah so we you know we we basically launched our client side app which links in with our Health Force Go app. Uh, that was about six months ago and uh, as of last week, 80% of all our shift requirements are now covered by app, and we expect by April next year it'll be 95%. So it's a huge, huge, uh, huge increase there. But you know, the, the technology is going to play a Im really important part in all of our lives moving forward, as you know, as we know. But specifically within healthcare, um, Ray Kurzweil, the futurist, you know, says the next 10 years is going to be like the last 100 years in terms of innovation. That's extremely exciting, but also disrupting. And we want to play uh, a role in actually making sure that that disruption is a positive force and a positive influence uh, within within healthcare, social care, uh, and um, yeah. So um, yeah, we've, uh, our, our focus definitely is towards technology. But again, you know, what I say to the team is that we are digitising the transactional, but humanising the exceptional. You know, we healthcare is a people business or people process and that's really 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 important um, and the technology you know enhances uh, those uh, it enhances those things so you know for us it's uh, it's, it's, it's people it's uh, partnership with uh, technology and uh, you I think hit the uh, the central point there the quintessence of social care is its humanity mm. and one of the initiatives um, I've been extraordinarily proud to be involved with uh, is the commitment that you made that Michelle made the board made when you surveyed the fact that actually there's a pandemic in terms of poor mental health, mm -hmm. NHS-wise, and social care, yeah. uh, and, and the business made the decision to offer free wellness modules, free wellness webinars, right across the NHS and social care. Yeah, absolutely, and um, you know, and as of this date, when we launched that, um, it was less than a year ago again, I think uh, 100,000 uh, NHS uh, employees have had the opportunity to uh, uh, of your support and of of, of new Cross's support, uh, which is uh, which is actually fantastic. But there's a lot to do. I mean, we we saw that 25% um, of the sickness uh, in the NHS in March was down to mental health issues. It's a mm. huge huge problem, Suhel. So um, you know, we 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 are just part of that solution, and we're proud, and we're happy, and we're. Uh, uh, and we want to we want to do whatever we can. I say not just obviously within the NHS as well. I mean, obviously in social, it's it's affecting care workers across all sectors of society. No, and I was particularly proud um, to represent uh, New Cross. We delivered those webinars for the Care Workers Charity during Professional Carers Week. So I think if you take the numbers, as you said, over 100,000 NHS staff across a dozen NHS organisations have had the opportunity and continue to have the opportunity to access the digital versions of the wellness webinars and the modules that we produced. And just briefly touching on digital uh, commitment, you, you've the business has put uh, the money behind its courage uh, and you've developed a 
a growing team in terms of research and development? Yeah, R and D plays a really, really important part. So I think we're up to 150 engineers plus now. We've got a uh, AI uh, uh, team uh, um, who are you know, looking at um, creating and ensuring that uh, you know New Cross stays at the forefront of technology, but also our reach. Uh, actually extends. We want to be the world's leading nurse resource management platform um, but we also want to democratise treatment and uh, care at, at home and um, you know to do that and to, the demands moving forward are going to be such that costs are going to become you know of course they're important now but costs are going to go up but how can we make those costs you know more affordable more effective use of funding and technology will play an important part within obviously the optimization of, uh, of of people and personnel and you were really excited about the concept of uh, virtual wards um, again I think uh, the, 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 the future of virtual wards is, uh, is, is one that's really right for the government to be focusing on and we believe that we could be providing some of the solutions around virtual wards um, again uh, a lot of uh, a lot of our efforts are working around in that type of spectre of uh, technology. Now you've touched on a lot of themes there, NHS funding, enabling of the workforce, social care, technology, how are we going to integrate them? These are all questions for policy makers, uh, for people who use the services, in fact our whole nation. And I remember uh, about a year ago an idea that you shared was why don't we create a platform that allows the best minds to come and speak about the not just the challenges but actually the opportunities and innovation in the sector and Voices of Care was born two million impressions later 30 episodes national coverage uh, I know you're a visionary but surely you didn't see where this would quite go or did you well I, I, I knew what was possible but obviously achieving that is a different matter so um, uh, yeah I'm, de I'm delighted and really I want to thank you uh, Suhail because we wouldn't be where we were today if it wasn't for you and your uh, and your commitment to Voices of Care so thank you for that but um, yeah I, I, and you know we, we've learned so much and uh, you know I've met a number of uh, a uh, num number of uh, people have been on Voices of Care and uh, you know, I think I know them already because I've been watching the podcast. It's, uh, but yeah, there's, a, there's some really, really interesting uh, 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 and important uh, comments that are coming out from that. And I hope you know, th what we're getting from Voices of Care resonates to the right ears, to the government, to society about some of the issues that need to be addressed but Voices of Care uh, is uh, there's a lot of opportunity in the future so you know we're not stopping where we are Voices of Care is moving forward and um, uh, perhaps you want to explain some of the uh, ideas and some of the things that we're going to be moving forward so no, absolutely and I think we've had as you said so many themes we've touched on inclusion we've touched on the role of technology how we can train the workforce in an innovative manner and some of the guests have just been fabulous Amazing. and been very open and I think giving them a forum <coughs> to speak about the art of the possible. I think that's what it was really important. Yeah. I'm personally grateful and extraordinarily proud to have been part of that journey. And as you say, next year, it's an election year, but uh, knowing you, we, we're looking many years beyond that. And I think the iteration for us in Voices of Care is now to look at a global picture, uh, absolutely inform the debate ahead of the general election and ask the policymakers from regulators, from providers, from private sector as well as the public sector to share their ideas as we move to answer some of the toughest questions that our society needs to answer. And I think for you, you've said earlier that the important point is not to have all the answers but to be willing to ask the questions. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Suhao. And if you think about, you know, we spent a long time uh, uh, speaking to some really really informed people within healthcare now's the time to hear especially with the election from the parties from governments from politicians what they are going to do because we're hearing quite a lot of hot air and we, we, we really need to know what what they're going to do so this is not from us this is we're just basically the uh, the, um, the the voice of care we are the voice of all of the great um, uh, interview uh, interviewees who have sat down here on this chair and um, hopefully we'll get some answers and hopefully help shape the future of health there. It's a privilege to be a part of that and thank you for inviting me to do that and thank you for giving us your time today. Pleasure. I'm delighted uh, to welcome Zoe Fry, Director at the Outstanding Society community interest company. 
to this uh, special episode of Voice of Care. Zoe, thank you so much for taking time out and joining us. Fantastic. Thank you for inviting me. No, my pleasure. And uh, I think the Outstanding Society is here in force today. I uh, took a walk uh, here at the care shows and saw where you're exhibiting and there's a huge crowd. So I think that you're here in full force. We are indeed. So I think it's a really exciting two days. We've got our own agenda and our learning lounge. So it's really exciting times. Six of our directors are here spanning across domiciliary care, LD services and residential and nursing care. And you're on the cusp of uh, next year, or a few months away now, from the 10th anniversary uh, since inception. Uh, m- many people, of course, know you, but could you just briefly explain the, the, the genesis of the Outstanding Society and uh, you know, a little bit about the mission that you're on? Of course. So I became part of the OS in 2014 and at that time it was a bit like an elite club for outstanding providers. There were about 80 80 people. We met twice a year. We were supported by CQC. Um, In 2021 during Covid everybody was sharing best practice. So we said why don't we set this up as a community interest company. Um, So we went from 80 members to over 3,000. It's absolutely amazing. We've got, um, like I say, we've got seven directors now. Um, It's free membership for everybody and it's open to absolutely everyone, irrelevant of their rating. You don't have to be outstanding. We're a very positive voice for adult social care. It's all about sharing and celebrating best practice, helping others to improve with a few different focuses. But yeah, I think it's a really exciting time for social care at the moment. No, and that's a great message because normally uh, when you see in the mainstream media, there are challenges in the sector uh, and it seems to be relentlessly focused on that but there's also a a, a vibrancy amongst the younger generation for this sector which is perhaps counterintuitive. I think you're uh, taking part as a judge in the inaugural uh, 30 Under 30 Awards. Absolutely I think that that was really exciting to see these awards this year and I think you've got so many leaders within the sector. I think you know succession planning, seeing where they are now what they can achieve at such an early age and I think we need to shout about that more we need to go out to schools we need to go out to universities and I think also we need to be talking to parents because if you talk to parents then they can raise the profile of adult social care and give it the the recognition that it rightly deserves. No absolutely well we've had uh, a plethora of announcements from people like Care England, the Home Care Association, National Care Forum, Professor Rick Rayner saying social care first, social care matters Um, but a lot of the work that you do also, um, your own background is quite distinctive having worked in the NHS, nursing, um, is to partner and develop research based case studies that help drive that best practice. Absolutely. I think if you look at the NHS, everything is data driven, everything's research based. We lack behind a little bit in adult social care. We're leading on the Vivaldi social care study at the moment with University College London and Care England actually. And what we've seen for the last 18 months, we've brought together academia, um, providers and policy makers. Um, we've onboarded over 800 care homes already. The project is due to start hopefully by the end of this year year. Um, we've got support from Care Rights UK, Deborah Sturdy, the Chief Nurse for Adult Social Care. So I think it's a really exciting time. We just need to change the language maybe. Mm. Data and research within social care is going to be about improving the lives of not only people living or under the care of us, team members as well, working environments. Absolutely and I think as you said earlier the idea is to promote the narrative of a sector actually with with opportunity. Uh, We've had uh, the Future Social Care Coalition report saying it's a sector whose economic potential needs to be unlocked uh, and as a career choice. Now the workforce plans, there has been one for the NHS, there may be one in social care at some point but while we wait for that I guess you're saying at the Outstanding Society it's about promoting that now as a career for people to choose positively. Without a doubt, and I think I think if you if you look at what Deborah Sturdy has set up, the Social Care Nursing Advisory Councils, I think that's a chance for adult social care to have a voice with the CNO from from 42 ICBs. Um, the councils have been set up only this year, and then we can take we can be the voice for the adult social care sector. 
take the points to the councils and then actually feedback out from the councils. If one ICB has got a, a fantastic setup, we've just had a conversation around training and clinical competences and how can we share that with the NHS? How can we be equal to the NHS as partners? Um, so I think I think snacks we call them is such an exciting opportunity. And people it's are not aware that actually uh, within social care there is a very significant nursing workforce uh, and that has dwindled but it continues to play a vital part so I guess these advisory councils will be at the heart of how that contribution continues to be developed. Yeah, we, we, without a doubt. So, so the chairs are all trained nurses. Um, I'm a nurse by background. I'm going to be the, the chair of Sussex, which I'm absolutely delighted with. And it is about that voice, and it's about encouraging student nurses to come out to our settings. We're working with universities as well. So, so if we if we can get the word out there and encourage people to come out to us. The nursing role within adult social care is so complex, it's so rewarding, um, you haven't got the backup of NHS doctors, you know, multidisciplinary team members. Um, it's such an exciting opportunity for, for newly qualified nurses as well to come out in, into the adult social care sector. And also we're obviously in a place now, a year or so since the Health and Care Act, integrated care systems are now on a statutory footing integration it's still baby steps in some cases but I, I think it's that agenda that the voice of social care in all its m multiple forms needs to be part of that discussion of integration and represented Care England have asked for that and I guess that's something that's very you're very passionate about yeah, without a doubt. I think I think Care England's voice um, is is absolutely fantastic, and we would fully support the plans that that they've they've recommended. And and again, coming back to the the social care nurse and advisory councils, I think that is going to be your voice into the ICBs because that is a voice for the chief nursing officer for that ICB. Absolutely. And just looking ahead a few moments, uh, uh, if I may, um, we've got of course uh, projections that. The social care sector is going to need, depends on which study you look at, 480,000 new workers in the next decade or so. We may be in danger of losing 430,000 because of demography. They're over 55. They may leave. So there's going to be an imperative to train uh, new people uh, and upskill the people that we have. Uh, we've got traditional pathways. What's your view about how that's going to be done? We're going to need some innovation and some disruption flexibility and I know again training for the outstanding society and best practice within that and finding the best avenues is, is a key part of your strategy. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I think every everybody does things differently. And I think I think especially looking at small independent providers, I think that's gonna be really, really important to, to link into training within ICBs. Um, what can we share? What can we share with other organisations? So I think that is going to be key. I think you've got you've got small innovations that providers are using. You know, how do you make training interesting? How do you get the training out to schools, to universities, so that people are actually seeing what you're doing and then wanting to come into the sector at a very early age? Yeah, and I think the younger generation if I can call them that um, much more used to VR and augmented reality uh, metaverses I, I guess there's also going to be we're going to need to turn the dial on all of those different pathways absolutely absolutely and and you know so social media and ev everything different that I think as you say the younger generation use um, and and I think it's it's got to transform very quickly as well mm. um, you know we, we talk about digitalizing adult social care I think you know we're we're quite behind with that at the moment so so yeah absolutely we need we need to change the way that we're doing things well I think with the advocacy that you're doing at the outstanding society in terms of its vision and purpose I think there's a there's a voice that the sector has there uh, as we move into potentially election year thank you so much for taking time out from a very very busy schedule and sharing your wisdom with us Zoe it's been a pleasure fantastic thank you for hosting if you've enjoyed this special episode of Voices of Care from The Care Show please like follow or subscribe wherever you receive your podcasts and if you want to find out more about how we are truly enabling the healthcare workforce of the future please visit newcrosshealthcare.com forward slash Voices of Care in the meantime I'm Sahel Mirza thank you and look forward to seeing you on the next episode